Welcome back to the ARM Viewpoints podcast, and it's going to be a good one. We're going to talk about the Internet of Things, or IoT as it's known more commonly, with an old friend of this show, Paul Williamson. Paul is the Senior Vice President and General Manager of the IoT line of business at ARM. This is just the latest in a number of key roles Paul has played at ARM. Welcome back, Paul. And I have to note that Paul is now the most frequent guest on this podcast, with today marking the fourth time we've had the good fortune to talk to you. So welcome back, Paul. That's fantastic. Thanks so much, Jeff. And always a pleasure to talk to you. It's always an interesting discussion. So why don't you start by telling us a bit more about your current role, and then we'll get into some fun questions. Sure. So as the leader of the IoT division at ARM, my team together define the compute that serves so many of the devices around us, everything from the smallest and simplest motor controllers or thermostats on the wall to complex and advanced uh, compute devices for things like robotic vision and automation in industry. So we're going to start with a bit of fun, as I said. Um, we played our lightning round game the last time we had you on the program in your role as head of the ARM client line of business, and it was highly entertaining. So we've got a few new warm-up questions for you this time. The, the first is a variation on desert island discs. Great. In this one, you're trapped on a desert island, but we want to ask what one book do you want? That's interesting. So on um, reading at the moment, I'm, I've always been a, a crime, uh, well, sort of spy fiction novels person. If anyone out there has been watching the Slough House series on Apple TV, um, the uh, Mick Heron is the author and his new book is out very shortly. And I've been uh, waiting that one eagerly. So that would be probably the one I'd want most at the moment is to find out what happens in that interesting saga. Fascinating, and I actually have been following the same series, so I'm excited that you said that. Okay. So, next question. If you could use technology to solve one problem in the world, what would that problem be? I think the area that I'm really interested in at the moment, and it's one that we're thankfully being able to be involved in, is, is energy. Energy and the way we can continue to evolve and develop our, our businesses and our lives um, but consume ca energy carefully. Um, so whether it be an incredible technology that just changes the way that we can generate it with less impact on the planet or the areas we're working on where we're helping to you know, consume it more intelligently at the right times of the day and to use uh, you know, the latest renewable energy more, f more frequently rather than relying on um, gas and coal. I think that, that would be really beneficial to the planet and something would be important amazing if I could snap my fingers and have it solved and deployed everywhere. Uh, we'll look forward to that. Okay. Okay, last one. You can dine with either Alan Turing or Stephen Hawking. Which one and why? And just as importantly, what would you have for dinner? <laughs> That's a great question. And I think I have to say, much though I have huge respect for Stephen Hawking, and I did once sit next to him in a cinema, which wasn't very interactive. Um, <laughs> actually, Alan, Alan Turing um, is the person that I'd be most interested to speak to. And I think that's partly uh, just, you know, the innovations in computing and obviously that being a core area of my life and, my, and the business here at Arm. But also just thinking about the personal tragedy around him and the discrimination he faced in his life and, and you know, to show him or talk to him about the way the world is emerging and whether that's getting better and, and the opportunity that provides for the world as well. I think that would be a fascinating discussion. Um, as to what we'd eat, um, I have no idea what the guy would enjoy, but I, I, I think on a personal level, I'd, um, I recently had the pleasure of one of our customers buying me an incredible uh, Japanese sushi dinner with a, uh, a chef in ironically in Taiwan and um, uh, it was just fabulous so um, repeating that dinner with him as a guest in a, a, a lovely private dining room would be uh, a, an exceptional experience I think. That sounds amazing. Okay well hopefully you're feeling warmed up now Paul. Now come some questions that are specific to the world of IoT. Since your new job represents a return to the world of IoT, I'm going to ask you to cast your mind back to when you first started working in IoT and how has the industry changed since then? The IoT business, I suppose I first started working in it as called as IoT back when I was working in a company called Cambridge Silicon Radio 
um, that that sort of 15 years ago or so. And um, Cambridge Silicon Radio, we were in an era where we were moving from audio connectivity to smartphones to starting to think about how can we connect more things to the connectivity of the smartphone. And the emergence of Bluetooth low energy as a technology, which I was fortunate to lead at CSR, really broke the mold and allowed us to create things that could connect and we could collect data from in a new way. So we were able to see that emergence and and deployment of things like you know fitbits and for me at the time nike fuel bands which were collecting personal data and relaying it to apps being able to display it giving you you know a really powerful user control in your hand Um, and that also created a change in the compute needs of these embedded devices suddenly they had to have more complex software stacks more memory uh, to be able to operate and and that really drove a, a step change and an evolution that continued for the subsequent 10 years. And those devices have got, you know, more proliferated around our homes with more smart home technology, but also um, have become, you know, more valuable. They now interact with each other through the cloud and, and can actually be more intelligent than the individual device. And that's caused, you know, ever greater complexity of standards. So we've seen, um, you know, the emergence of newer standards now um, that are trying to pull together these in-home devices and these personal connected devices to share data. And that's once again, stepping up the need for more compute, more memory and, and more power in these devices. Um, so it's it's been an evolution and a trend that, that progressed for a, a quite a, a long time. Um, but we are, I think, on the verge of a new wave and, and that's gonna be interesting. Yeah, so you mentioned intelligence and intelligence in the devices. And artificial intelligence, or AI, is the buzzword at the moment, mostly around generative AI powered by data centers. But AI and machine learning are having a profound impact on IoT. And much of it is starting to be processed at the edge. So let's talk a little about what's behind that. Yeah, so AI is increasingly being used for everything. And AI today is happening on ARM. In fact, everywhere AI is happening, ARM is is present. But um, you know, there's the in fact, a, you know, eighty five percent of smartphones are running machine learning workloads on the CPU itself, rather than using any kind of specialized technology. So it's already widely present, and we see it in IoT in the home with devices like our Alexa for voice control and um, using AI to recognize our voices and respond to us. So it's definitely becoming more and more pervasive and that's changing again, as I said, this sort of the need for the compute capability in these IoT devices. They're moving from needing to do simple sensing to more advanced sensing and making more use of machine learning as a key workload to solve the problems they face. Um, And that means more complex software and also connectivity to the cloud. And I think actually a smart speaker is a good model, but shows how you're having to increase that compute and software complexity and also the connectivity that comes with it. But it also sort of is going to apply in many other even simpler things. Even even those simple motor controllers or thermostats I described are going to be using machine learning for analytics in the future. So we need to bring inference down in a cost and power effective way into all of those devices. Yeah, and as you mentioned those devices, you remind me that over the years, IoT has seen an immense range of application possibilities. Where do you see right now the most interesting growth opportunities in terms of IoT deployment? What types of applications have captured your imagination? I think most recently I've been on a bit of an adventure into the world of industrial IoT and also smart cities. When we think about a smart city and the scale of smart city and something like electrification of vehicles and bringing smart charging infrastructure into that broad city environment Um, initially you think about the you know the the post that you're going to plug your car into and and the fact that's going to need you know compute capability to handle charging uh, or payment and uh, user interface to control the charging but then you go beyond that individual device and you think about the um, you know, the more mundane things that are hidden behind the scenes, something like a substation, the, the amount of uh, control systems and switching control gear and power management for the network that sits behind that that needs to be connected to deliver these higher levels of current quickly into new infrastructure across the city. So 
And then you're coordinating that with the grid, with power production across the whole of a city or across the whole of a nation. Um, you know, there's a huge amount of connected infrastructure that's going into that. So, you know, learning more about that has sort of really opened my eyes to the opportunity, I guess, for um, for us all in, in improving these systems, but also the complexity and the amount of work we have to do to put them together. Yeah, complexity and a lot of work. Um, Designing and developing for the edge means balancing a lot of factors. You have power, space, and connectivity considerations just to start with. So what's your sense for how the world's evolving there? I think, I think one common theme I've mentioned is the ever-continuing demand for more compute in these device, devices. But I think you, you raise a, um, a, a very sensible point in addition to that, which is You've got to do that across this full scale. You've got to do it across this sort of very small little sensor that might be running off a coin cell all the way through to these huge data centers with, you know, immense amount of power at their, at their request to um, be able to compute. So that takes uh, a, lot of, a lot of work. It also means you've got to think about other considerations beyond that around um, the software infrastructure or, or the frameworks that are going to be in place to allow developers to access the compute that we're putting into more of these devices. So we've been thinking a lot about machine learning and AI in particular and how to bring that down into deeply embedded devices. So we've done a couple of fairly significant things over the last couple of years in our you know, Cortex-M line of processors, which are the really small, low-power processors we have. We've introduced new instruction capabilities that accelerate vector and matrix mathematics, which makes it more efficient to run these machine learning tasks in small, low-power devices. And then we've also brought in a new line of accelerators under a brand called Ethos. And what those allow you to do is go even more optimal um, on power. So they're even more power efficient when you're main operation is machine learning, then they can run at an even more efficient PowerPoint. So um, this is something that is allowing us to bring ever more performance, even while the power envelope remains very constrained. Um, but, you know, looking more broadly, going back to those industrial segments, we have areas where we're not as power constrained. And there we can use a mix of different performance um, IP to bring together a solution that is optimal for that space as well. So more deployment of Linux software development in those environments, we're seeing more of our A-class higher performance processes be deployed and even GPUs, as I said, to handle things not only for machine learning tasks, but also for having you know a user interface on those devices. So it is a full suite of IP that's required to solve these complex problems. Yeah, and when you talk to designers and developers who are putting all these things together, what else are they asking for or curious about? Yeah, it's funny you should ask about that because we've uh, actually recently completed a, a survey in this space. We went out and spoke to about 600 developers, managers and executives, and um, they've been looking at this problem and they've been telling us a bit about what it takes for them to compete in their own markets and, and the opportunities they have to grow. Um, and one thing's clear, you know, they're tired of fragmentation. It's really important that when they develop their software and they're targeting, you know, solving their problem, you know, they don't want to be troubled with individually porting or picking up new environments or moving to a specific platform. They want to be able to just move faster and innovate faster towards their goal. So standardization in the software frameworks has been really critical. So building on the same CPR architecture supports that goal. But as they innovate faster to be effective, they're also looking, as the survey showed, to embrace standards. And there's a couple of areas that they're doing that in, but one of them in particular for us is security. Making sure that you can secure your IoT device is critical. It's clear that if it's going to live in the field in something like that smart city infrastructure, it needs to remain updated and secured for its lifetime. So being able to take common software frameworks and access to security with the initiatives that we've been driving around things like um, the platform security architecture at ARM really help them in that goal of, of achieving security uh, in their device development. So we talk about security and standards. Um, overall, how critical are standards-based initiatives for enabling innovation, particularly in relation to IoT? Yeah, I've, uh, 
I have an analogy I think about in in when you think about how a network works and and in IoT it is a network of devices gathering collecting information and actuating and making decisions and when you are doing that if you're let's say you're building out your distribution center um for some kind of logistics program for parcel delivery um when you're controlling that and you're switching these motors to coordinate all of the devices in that big big warehouse um, you need to be sure that the information you're receiving and that you're acting on is information from your sensor, not something else in the system. You know, you don't want to be going and powering things down or, you know, causing things to crash into each other or ignore their control uh, impulses because of, you know, rogue data that you're receiving. So you need to be able to validate and trust the data on which you're going to make decisions. And particularly when you're using machine learning and there's not a human in the loop to sort of observe or take care of these systems as they're getting bigger and more complex, you know, beyond human scale problems, you're going to have to be able to trust the data that you're acting on. So securing the device and being able to authenticate that the data that you're acting on is coming from the device that you care about is really critical. You can't innovate and, and change these systems to more advanced machine learning based systems unless you have that foundational trust. So moving beyond standards and turning to IoT and ARM specifically, what does it mean that IoT runs on ARM? And maybe let's talk about some cool examples. Uh, So yeah, in IoT runs on ARM is our way of thinking about the interaction we're having with that that very vast software development community, over 15 million software developers globally who are writing software to target ARM-based platforms. And we recognize that you know they need to be able to have that trust in, in those base platforms and they need to have access to the right tools and software to be able to get the performance they need for their innovations. So what we need to do is make sure that we're giving them that access that they need to be successful. Um, so there's a there's a range of things that we see as examples of people making use of our technology, um, and you know the the areas we're seeing that are really interesting are things like smart home. You know we've discussed already a lot about smart city and industry and 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 warehousing and and logistics, but another area that that's fascinating is the smart home. And so innovations like the Matter protocol, which I sort of referenced earlier in in talking about how smart home devices talk to each other. Uh, are showing the ability to bring more of those devices into our home and have them work more seamlessly together with that level of trust uh, across standards. So rather than having you know, an individual app or an individual provider for each one of these different things and having to sort of treat them separately, we can actually bring their intelligence together so that they can sort of be designed to live around us rather than us having to sort of live around controlling them. And I, I think that's pretty cool, thinking that our homes are going to react and be more responsive to us in future rather than us have to sort of manually interact and sort of individually task each device with what it needs to do. Um, for them to understand us as people, our preferences and, and you know, react to us, I think is fantastic. But I think the further layer that excites me that sort of wraps this back to that sort of example of electric charging and energy that we discussed is if they can do that in a way that also helps the world. You know, if your devices can decide to use electricity and and sort of sip at it when coal-fired power stations are on, but, you know, guzzle it down when the wind power is sort of uh, channeling, you know, through the windstorms to to sort of give a surplus is something that could sort of change the perspective on solving some of the global problems as well. So making our homes smarter will make them more livable, but it will also hopefully help us towards goals like improving their energy efficiency. And I, I think that's that's really exciting. Yeah, it is exciting. So I'm going to wrap up by asking what we can expect from ARM going forward when it comes to AI and IoT. Today, as I look at it, the most innovative organizations are leveraging AI to solve problems in new ways. Um, and, and I've mentioned a few today. And I think you're going to see ARM feeding that demand for AI and helping to ensure that it's available on the broadest range of devices from those high performance down to the most power efficient devices. And we're going to use a range of the tools that are our fingertips to bring together, you know, example reference systems to show how you can achieve 
machine learning in embedded environments and our ethos accelerators are probably the best example of really squeezing every power optimization out of this to allow you to deliver ml in even the very smallest device i think we're really just scratching the surface of the potential of ai and machine learning applied to all sorts of products and the more that arm can you know solve this problem of putting it at the fingertips of innovators everywhere means that we're going to see it opening up a new future for ML and AI running on ARM. Thanks, Paul, for your insight on IoT, for helping us all uh, understand a little bit more about what makes you tick, and for being our first four-time guest. It's always great to have you here, now and in the future. And speaking of the future, we look forward to bringing you more news in the next episode of ARM Viewpoints, and look forward to connecting with you all again soon. Thanks for listening today. 